Hey guys, Pastor Mark again, here to talk about some of the things going on in the world. A ton of stuff going on this week in the news. We had an attempted assassination of a Supreme Court justice. Um, you had a supposedly family-friendly drag show at a strip club in Dallas. Uh, the Congress House of Representatives passed a, some kind of gun legislation that's not likely to go anywhere. Uh, the January 6th committee had a uh, hearing on primetime TV, and we have some good news coming out of Galveston and Raleigh, North Carolina, with some feel-good stories. That is just a few of the things that are going on beyond the pews. So let's get into this. Let's, let's talk about these things, because there's some interesting stuff. I think these are some things going on in the world that we need to be aware of, um, not just specifically because of their occurring, but because of the ideas that lay behind them. Um, first up, this attempted assassination of uh, Supreme Court justice. How crazy are things getting that the Supreme Court, people are threatening and protesting, um, and not literally threatening the Supreme Court justices. They're supposed to be non-political. They're supposed to be where they just dispense the rulings. They're not swayed by the public. They don't go according to public opinion. They go according to the law. But here we have people attempting to sway them uh, in other means. Ever since the leak had come out about the uh, uh, draft opinion on Roe versus Wade, and it's showing that um, the absolutely horrible previous ruling on Roe versus Wade is going to be overturned. Uh, no matter how you land on the abortion issue, you've got to be able to admit that that was absolutely terrible legal reasoning. Um, but that leak came out of showing it might be overturned and people lost their mind. They're just so dedicated to needing to be able to kill their babies and sacrifice their children to their um, own comfort and success. Uh, and so protesters had actually started uh, protesting outside of Supreme Court justices' homes, uh, which, by the way, is illegal. Uh, it, it violates both state and federal laws, but nothing was ever done about it. And in fact, uh, the press secretary, Jen Psaki, former press secretary, Jen Psaki, at one point had actually encouraged Yes, we encourage people to go and protest and let their voices be heard at the justices' houses. That's kind of crazy. Uh, that's illegal. You have the White House encouraging people to go break the law. Well, with all of this hype and everything going on, someone who uh, supposedly says that his motivation was um, the overturning of Roe versus Wade and potential rulings on Second Amendment that might be coming out soon, uh, that he was going to Justice Kavanaugh's house. He had weapons. He had uh, gear looked like possible kidnapping. Uh, torture was going on or, or intended to be going on. Um, but he ended up, he, he got close, but for whatever reason, um, change of heart or, or whatever, I'm not sure at this point, he ended up turning himself in. And so that was averted. However, just a few hours later, because that happened in the wee hours of the morning, well, later that day, protesters are back at Justice Kavanaugh's house protesting and not being arrested. I just think it's kind of crazy that we, we see in our society across the board in so many places where um, there's selective enforcement of the law. And I think that this gets to an issue where there's a difference in values. And I think we'll see this in all the stories that we have looking at today, where the, the core values and principles upon which decisions are being made are total opposites. Because on one hand, you have the biblical Judeo-Christian uh, value system that our system of government has built upon that said equal protection under the law, equal representation under the law. And then on the other hand, um, it's a might makes right. Um, if it's for a good cause, you look the other way. If it's the people you disagree with, you throw the book at them. 
And so that's what we have going on all over the place where you have in like San Francisco, I think it is where uh, the police will not prosecute, the police will not arrest, the DA will not prosecute uh, petty theft up to like $1,000. So you can go in and steal $900 worth of stuff and they won't touch you. It's selectively enforcing of the law. No, stealing is stealing. You're not allowed to do it. And we see the same thing going on here. Um, I don't think that any of us could honestly disagree that if this were Republican protesters at one of the leftist judges' house, that the, the police would absolutely be called in because the double standard of you enforce what benefits you rather than the underlying principle of uh, pursuing of justice equally. It's kind of a scary road to be going down. Um, which kind of relates to another one of the stories that are out there. Uh, they all actually kind of have this theme going through them. So the House of Representatives, I believe, passed a bill, passed some legislation uh, on uh, guns because with the latest shooting, um, everybody is emotional. And by the way, whenever you are panicking or fearful or worked up or angry is the absolute worst time to make decisions and pass legislation. That being said, they passed some legislation. Um, one of the big things that were in there that I hear people talking about is the issue of the age that they raised, they're trying to raise the age of being able to possess so-called assault weapons, which any weapon's an assault weapon. Uh, right now, the chair I'm sitting in could be an assault chair if I so determined. So that's just kind of a meaningless uh, label to put on something. but. Uh, long guns, rifles, uh, things such as, you know, the AR-15 is the popular one and all that sort of stuff. So they're saying, no, no, you can't have those until you're 21. Well, that's an interesting thing. The way that our culture just delineates, is that that's probably not even the right word, um, divides the age of becoming an adult. When are you an adult? For most things, it's 18. You can't vote till you're 18. You can't serve in the military till you're 18. Um, all sorts of things that at 18, that's when you become an adult. Unless you want to drink. You can't drink until you're 21. Uh, if you want to drive a car, you can do that at 16. Uh, if you want to enter into an intimate adult relationship, some states, you can do that at 17 or 16. And others, it's 18. I, it, we just have this weird thing where it's like, okay, when do you become an adult? Because now they're saying that at 18, you can vote and you can serve in the military, but you can't actually own weapons until you're 21. Well, are you an adult or are you not? There, there's this thing where we're focusing on pragmatics, which actually aren't all that pragmatic, rather than looking at um, the principle, rather than actually what, what is the foundational logic and reasoning behind what is going on. Because if you're an adult, you're an adult. And, and you have the rights, the constitutionally guaranteed rights of the God-given rights of being an adult. You have the right. So you have the rights at 18, but you have to wait till 21 to use them. So that, none of this is making sense. But even more than that, regardless of how you feel about guns, regardless of um, where you stand on why people should have guns or what guns they should have or not, the weird kind of thing going on is where they're blaming the tool and they're punishing the group for what a very small number of people have done. And I think we've all experienced this kind of thing. I remember being at work uh, job I was working at one time there where uh, the employer provided, you know, free drinks, complimentary, you know, had, had a refrigerator with drinks uh, for the employees. And it was just free, right? Get thirsty, go get a drink. Um, and had it stocked with basically everything you could want of, you know, sodas and water and all that sort of thing. Well, there was one employee who would have three or four sodas throughout the day or more. And then at the end of the day, it would go to leave and would grab two and take them home with them on his way out the door. Well, the the boss said, you know, hey, guys, you know, we're kind of abusing the, 
the, the, the drinks. And so now we're not going to do it complimentary. Everybody has to pay. So you take a drink, you give a quarter or whatever it was. And it's like that the entire group, we all knew who was abusing it. We all knew who the problem was. We all knew the reasoning. We all knew the motivation behind the change. So now all of a sudden, everyone is um, getting punished, for lack of a better word, because of what one person was doing, rather than dealing with that one person. And this has happened many times over and over again, where I've been working in an environment where every, we, there, there's a way that things are going, and it's going really good, but one person won't behave. And so they change the rule to affect everybody else, disrupt everyone else's work environment, change everything for other people who did nothing wrong. Okay, whenever you punish someone for something that someone else did, we have a word for that. It's called injustice. It is wrong to do that. It, you don't punish people for something that someone else did. It's absolutely horrible, terrible thing that these deranged people go and commit these crimes. But then you, because of what they did, now you go and you punish people who haven't done anything wrong. Okay, that is not good. So, okay, sorry. Wasn't trying to preach. But you see what I'm getting about, about the difference of values, right? Over and over again on all these issues, we're, we're seeing where it's like, okay, here is the principle of what it is that, you know, reality of the thing, the objective moral principle that we need to live by versus whatever is going to make you feel good or whatever pragmatic thing that they think is going to solve the problem. You don't punish people for something someone else did. Full stop. Okay. Didn't mean to get preachy there. Um, next. Crazy things going on. So in Dallas. In Dallas. Come on, Dallas. This is Texas. Um, they had as part of Pride Month and why we're being proud and celebrating a certain group of people's, um, I don't know, particular sexual preferences. I, why, why do we need a whole month to celebrate what a group of society likes to do uh, to scratch that particular itch? I, I don't know. So as part of all of that, they had a drag show. It was marketed, I guess, as a family-friendly drag show, and had um, children, families, parents brought their kids to this drag show. And at this drag show, which if you don't know what a drag show is, it's men dressing up as women and dancing, you actually had kids giving money to the dancers, you know, like you do when you go to a strip club, or so I've been told, uh, where, you know, the dancers and you give them money. It, including even, you know, sticking money into their garments, such that, as they are. And so you have this supposedly family-friendly drag show going on where you have children giving money to these male dancers dressed up as women dancing. You even had uh, some children participating, you know, kids in drag, and it's at a strip club. And regardless of what they might want to say about it being family-friendly, it was still at a strip club which had so-called adult signage um, up on the walls. So, so, so even if, and it wasn't, but even if what was going on was innocent, the setting certainly was not, but what was going on absolutely was not innocent. You know, the crazy thing is, if you were to take a child into a heterosexual strip club, you'd be arrested, have CPS called. There'd be some kind of problem, some kind of trouble. But because it is the ever so saintly LGBT event, well now that is different, that's allowed. This double standard where um, you have the, the people who are just striving to sexualize and groom children Somehow, they're the saintly ones, and if you disagree and actually want to protect children, you're the hateful bigot. There's something crazy going on here, and we've, I, I don't know how, but, I, I mean, 
This can't stand. They're abusing children. I don't know what we do about that, but it's something we need to be aware of, that it is going on. So that is one of those things going on out there beyond the pews. Okay. Lastly, of the big stories, and there are so many things that went on this week. Uh, January 6th committee hearing was uh, put out there on primetime TV for all the world to see because they're getting at the truth of what was uh, one of the worst terrorist attacks in American history, which is a total, total fabrication. Look, what, what happened on January 6th, it was a riot, it was horrible. People who committed violence and vandalism they absolutely need to be arrested. They need to be held to account. Remember, that's one of our values is equal application of the law. If you broke the law, you go to jail, regardless of uh, the point. And you get the proper punishment for what you did, regardless of your political position. However, um, you, you can tell whenever someone is either ignorant or lying about January 6th because they will call it an insurrection or an attempted coup. It was neither of those things. It was a riot, pure and simple. Um, and we all know about riots because we experienced a full summer of riots all across the country in 2020 as cities were looted and burned and police were told to stand down and you even had like a six city block area, you know, declared an autonomous zone. Um, was it in Seattle or Portland? Maybe both. I don't remember. Um, so riots happen. And that's what this was. It was a riot where a peaceful protest where you had literally hundreds of thousands of people at the peaceful gathering. And then you had a few hundred who uh, went into the building. And of those few hundred who went into the building, a small percentage of them got violent. And so this was not an insurrection. This was not a coup. No one was armed. Um, so if, if, if someone is calling this a coup or an insurrection, just know that that person either has no idea what they're talking about or they are lying to you. So that's just the fact of what happened. It was horrible. It was ugly. It never should have happened. And the people who um, committed crimes actual crimes, not just people who the police welcomed in, but people who actually committed crimes need to be punished for the crimes they committed. Um, the problem was it was such a big place and so much going on. On one side of the building, you had police fighting with uh, protesters in the riot. And then on the other side, you had police holding the doors open, welcoming people in saying, yeah, sure, come on in. It's okay. And taking selfies with people. And then, so on one side, you have people busting and breaking windows. On the other side, you have people just walking around, looking at stuff, taking pictures. However, they're treating the people who just walked in, welcomed in by the police, as they're treating the people who violently attacked. And it's all being thrown in together. That is not what happened. Do not let people tell you that it was a coup or insurrection. It absolutely was not. Okay. So about this hearing, the crazy thing was, like 75% of the time in the hearing was spent on the election, on things that happened weeks and months before. They had nothing to do with January 6th. What they were doing was they were just taking the time to pound the table and you know beat their chest about, you know, Trump bad, big lie. I mean, was the election stolen? There, it has not been proven. Were there some questions that made people go, hey, wait, wait, wait a minute, what's going on over there? Yes, absolutely. It was tainted. There were all kinds of questions all over the place. Um, that, that doesn't mean that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president or that he needs to be yanked out and Trump put in, that kind of thing. That's not how the system works. Okay, votes were counted. Biden's in. Um, were they legitimate votes or not? There were questions that never got answered. Fine. Fraud happens. Um, miscounting happens. Uh, bad ballots happen. That's part of the system. It happened. We move on. Um, but we would like to know what happened and why, so we can keep it from happening again in the future. But that aside, this isn't about the election. It's about January 6th, but they spend 75% of their time talking about the election. It's not about the election. Okay, people were upset about the election, yes, but they came to peacefully rally and protest to let their voice be heard. And then a 
really small percentage of those people there rioted. And that's all that happened. So it's not about the election, but January 6th. Who did what on January 6th? So they spent all this time talking about the election when the election isn't the issue. January 6th is the issue. And what really needs to be answered on January 6th, I hope they get to, because this will be the first hearing of, I think, three, they got three or four, I don't remember. Um, are they going to get to the questions about why was the Capitol left undefended? One of the witnesses they had, um, she was one of five police officers who basically had those little um, waist-high bike rack kind of barriers. And then, you know, you have thousands of people come up. And whenever um, someone hmm, um, removes the barrier, you have five cops. Five cops to defend against thousands of people coming up. But why were there only five cops? If you look back to whenever you had the Black Lives Matter um, rallies, protests, you, you had like riot gear and SWAT. I mean, we know how to protect this building. Why weren't they protecting the building? Those questions need asked, but they're not getting asked. They're talking about the election rather than the day and why it was left undefended. And then in their presentation, things were deceptively edited. So there's one instance where in a video it shows, um, you know, the, the crowd kind of surges and pushes over barrier and the police officer standing behind the barrier is knocked to the ground. What they don't show is that like three seconds later, several people from the protesters come and help her up. This wasn't like a violent altercation. It was, oh, you got knocked down. Here, let me help you up. And so, you know, you had that instance. Um, you, you have an instance that they always like showing where some people are busting on trying to break into a window. Uh, what they don't show, because they always show like the two or three second clip of people bashing on the window. What they don't show is following where the crowd is saying, hey, stop it, stop it. You have where they're quoting um, the, the president during his speech saying, we're going to go to the Capitol. Yeah, they don't show where the next thing he says is uh, and peacefully let our voices be heard. They, they, they quote the tweet where he's saying, you know, I understand you're angry and this is what happens whenever people's voices aren't heard, you know, but they leave off the last line where he says, go home in peace and love. So, I, you know, I mean, there's all these kinds of things that if, you're, if you've actually been watching and paying attention, if you've actually seen some of the footage, if you've actually been reading things, you see whenever they present something that is specifically edited to not show you the full story. And that's kind of scary. Because here we have a committee, which is not even a valid committee. Um, it doesn't have the right, I forget the number and the arrangement, how it's supposed to be, uh, isn't correct. It doesn't actually have the legitimate authority to investigate this issue. Uh, it's not actually in the purview of Congress. Um, congressional investigations have to have a legislative aim. It, it, they're not a criminal investigative body. Um, and uh, the, the way Congress works is that each party gets to appoint their own members. Republicans are not allowed to appoint their own members. Um, and so the, the whole thing is illegitimate. They're lying about what happened and they're deceptively, deceptively editing things. Now we can all agree that what happened on January 6th was absolutely atrocious. We can all agree that um, Joe Biden won the election uh, when the counts were done. Right? We, we, I mean, we, we could argue about some little instances of, you know, well, should that have been happened or they changed this and was that legal or, you know, that recount should have been done this way or that way or whatever. But, okay, fine. Fact is, end of the day, Biden's president, whatever other questions we have about the election, that's that. On January 6th, why weren't there cops? Why wasn't there protection? Why was it left unguarded? Why did you have some police fighting protesters and then on the other side you had police welcoming them in? These are the questions that need to be asked, and they need to be asked, and the evidence needs to be shown in a truthful and honest manner. It's kind of crazy what's going on. So with all the crazy, let's have some good news. All right, two stories um, that I think are really neat. 
uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Speaking of police, um, in Raleigh, North Carolina, police were called to a domestic disturbance um, where someone said in their apartment building that they heard yelling and arguing, what sounded like arguing to them outside. Five police officers show up and they come upon a birthday party with a bunch of little kids. And so they go and talk to the adults and the adults say, yeah, no, no one's arguing or anything. It's just a little kid party. And so the police then, discovering that there is nothing going on, uh, then decide to play with the kids. And they spend some time playing some football and hanging out and talking with the kids. So good on them. Way to go, Raleigh PD. Um, closer to home here in Texas in Galveston, you had a... Uh, boat that washed up on the jetties down there in Galveston, those uh, rocks that stick out into the ocean. Um, someone sees the stranded boat, they call the Coast Guard, but before the Coast Guard can even get there to do a rescue, they, uh, the, this bystander, the, this good Samaritan had come by and um, rescued the four members of that boat. Coast Guard comes, gets them taken to safety where they can get checked out and everything. So with all the craziness that's going on, it's easy for us to look at government, to look at the big things and get frustrated. But the answer to those big things are the little things. The answer to the, what do we do about all this policing stuff? Well, how about we have people of the mindset that says they're there to serve the community and the kind of cops are gonna show up and not just rush in uh, assuming the worst, but whenever they show up and realize that it's not going on, that they're the kind that are going to hang out and play with the kids. Um, how about we be that kind of people? That's how you change policing issues, is by having cops to play with kids. And I know that's a small thing, but, but the good-heartedness, that's how you make the change in the policies, by making the change in the hearts. How about we be the kind of people that whenever we uh, see someone in need, we don't just call for someone else to come help, but we go help them ourselves. And so with all the craziness that's going on beyond the pews, we need to be sure that we are a people who follow Christ, not only when we're in the pews, but also live according to the Bible and the teachings of Christ whenever we go out into the world beyond. That little church on liberty Come praise the Lord, let your cup be filled. Raise your voices and we'll sing. Let God's freedom ring from that little church on liberty.